Hey, wilderness adventure friends, who wants to go on a safari? An Appalachian backyard safari, that is. Let's go over to our friend Sheldon and learn all about moths. Hello everyone, I am Sheldon Owen, Extension Wildlife Specialist with West Virginia University, and today I'm with Sue Alcott, Wildlife Biologist with West Virginia Division of Natural Resources. Sue, thank you for joining us today. Sue, what is your favorite thing to do in your job? My favorite thing is that often I do different things every day, and mostly what I've been doing lately is working with butterflies and moths. And maybe another episode we can do butterflies, but tonight we're gonna look at moths. Everybody has seen a moth, right? You see them on your windows at night. You see them flying around your porch light. And we're gonna take a closer look at them and sort of discover some things about them. All right, so tonight we're going on a moth safari. Sue, tell me what kind of setup you have right here. Okay, all you need to do, this is an old, it's actually, it's a lightweight blanket, but a sheet, anything Light colored, white is best because that reflects the light better and the moths tend to be attracted to it a little bit more. What I've done is tied knots up at the corner. So there's something for the rope to grab a hold of. I happen to have something I can hang it from up above, but you can tie a rope across like your porch and use clothespins to attach it here. And the important thing is just to have it hang down to the ground have a little bit on the ground, because often moths will come down here and then they want to crawl down on the ground down here. And then you have a light that's going to shine across here. And so the moths want to settle someplace when they're attracted to light. And often they'll settle on this white thing right here. But you have to be, remember that often they'll settle on the front, but remember to look at the back, because sometimes they'll be on the back, sometimes they'll be where it's a little bit dimmer off on, to one side as well. So you have to look all around to find the moths. And there'll be little tiny moths, probably a lot of little tiny moths, but also bigger moths. And moths with colors and patterns, they're very interesting. West Virginia probably has something like 2,000 types of moths that live here. It's a lot of moths. <laughs> and there may be even more than that, because there are a lot of moths that scientists haven't even found yet. So you might even find a moth that hasn't been found yet. You never know. Sue, we've talked about some citizen science projects mm -hmm. where citizens, like the, the kids out there, can get involved with some of our wildlife programs here in West Virginia. We've mentioned looking for box turtles and also mm -hmm. maybe rattlesnakes. Uh, are there citizen science projects going on right now with moths or any other insects? One thing that happens every year is called National Moth Week. And you can put that in your search engine on your computer, put in National Moth Week. And I, it's usually in the middle of July, and you can actually sign up. And what you do, you can take pictures of the moths and send them to an expert to get identified. And you can send them your list of the moths that you see, and that gets added into a big database. And that helps to help scientists learn about moths. Okay, Sue, so the sun is set. Uh, it's getting a little bit dark, so we're getting ready to go on our moth, moth safari. But we have a few that are joining us tonight. So let me introduce to you our uh, junior naturalists who are going out with us this evening. First off, we have... Hi, I'm Cooper. I'm McKenna. I'm Alden. Three junior naturalists are ready, excited to go on a moth hunt. All right, we've set up a sheet with a light on it on the back porch. We've also set up two screens, which are very similar to a white sheet with lights projected on them out in the woods and also in the backyard. Uh, so we've got different vegetation types that we're, we're going to try to look and see if we can draw in some different moths in those vegetation types. A lot of our wildlife species across West Virginia, including the moths, are found in a particular type of habitat. And so we can find these in maybe in forests or in fields or around your house. So we're going to look in these different types of areas to see if we can find any difference in the moths that we capture. We're going to wait till it gets good and dark. I've got a handy dandy flashlight, a headlamp, a field guide. So when we find those, uh, since I don't know anything about moths, I can hopefully this field guide will help me identify them. So we're waiting till it gets good and dark and then we'll see what comes into those lights. 
So you don't have to have a sheet or, or a specialized screen to set up to do this. You can just simply cut on the back porch or the front porch light or just some external light, some outside light that you can leave on and see what moths come into it. So it could be just as simple as going outside and looking around the light to see what moths come in. We've cut on the front porch light here at Sue's house just to see if we can find some coming to the front door, the front porch area. So now I've got to go find Sue and my young naturalist and see what kind of moths are coming into our screens tonight. All right, y'all, gather around. I think we have something now. This is a cool find here. This is an eye omo. There. And this is a male. Often males are attracted to lights more than the females, but not always. And their caterpillars have stinging hairs on them. And if you have the unfortunate experience of getting touched by them, it's like fire. It's like it's like nettles. You ever get get stung by nettles? That plant. Anyways, it's really stinging. They're green and have little spiky things on them, but they're really pretty moths. Okay. Uh, are they called io moths? Yeah, I O. Uh, they look like they have eyes on the back. No, it's um, it's spelled I O. I think it refers to a lot of moths are named for like Greek gods and goddesses and celestial things and everything. And these are, these are, um, woolly bear caterpillars, that's the adult, um, Isabella tiger moth. Oh, that's a rosy maple moth. That's related to the ion moth, it's one of the silk moths. Oh, that's a nice fresh one too. That one's gorgeous. You want color? You want color, Sheldon? Look at that one. That's nice. Isn't that nice? Okay. And here's one that we haven't seen before. And when you find one, you don't know quite what it is, you can look it up in the book. And I know this is a primitive moth, uh, called a micro moth. So I know it's in the beginning of the book. And. You can see the pattern, it's sort of rusty at the front of the wings and a white stripe and then darker towards the back. And this is called a yellow-shouldered slug moth because we looked it up in the book. Cool. Look at this one that looks it's so well camouflaged to sit on moss. Oh yeah, yeah. And they do. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll hang out on moths or on lichens, on trees especially. Uh -huh. They just disappear. And again, depending upon how they develop, the temperatures they develop at, sometimes they'll be bigger or smaller. If the caterpillar didn't get really good nutrition, they'll be bigger or smaller. Actually, that could be a female too. Look at the markings. I've never seen one like that before. That's really cool. There's lots of theories about why moths are attracted to light. You've heard the... Um, saying like a moth drawn to a flame to describe somebody who does something that's not really good for them but they're sort of you know, obsessed with it or something mm. and that's sort of what moths are like they always fly to lights but nobody really knows why mm. he's very good mm. those are all is it the other moths oh no that's an other moth he's shaking these two um Guys came from woolly bears, you know, woolly bear caterpillars. That's the adult form. That is the pretty moose. But uh, you, you just slowly like, sort of slide your hand under them, and they may or may not stay on your finger. You have to be very gentle and slow. Yeah, they'll vibrate their wings to keep their wing muscles warm so they can fly. Oh. It says they're because they're cold blooded. Mm -hmm. But moths often have a lot more, you call it fur, they're just modified scales to help insulate them. So you see a lot of birds with like the males having brighter colors than the females. Is it the same for moths or no? Not really, because moths are out at night. Colors don't really make much difference to them because they don't really see them. Their colors during the day are mostly to escape predation during the day. Like the isle moth that has bright eye spots on the hind wings, it'll be sitting like that with just the yellow out, but then the, all, the, all of a sudden open up their forewings and show the eye spots and it, it distracts a bird because it looks like eyes. They think it's something big and scary. 
and it gives the moth a chance to get away. How do you tell the difference between moths and butterflies? Okay, well this is a good example. Look at this aisle moth here. And number one, they're out at nighttime. And butterflies are pretty much only out during the day. So that's one thing, their behavior. Number two, notice the antenna on the aisle moth. See how they look like little feathers. Other moths have antenna that just look like little threads. A butterfly has an antenna, it's like a little stick with a knob on it. So that's another really good way to tell the difference between a butterfly and a moth. So you look at when they're flying, and then you look at what their antenna looks like. Often, too, a lot of moths, even though the eye moth is very colorful, a lot of moths are just sort of dull colors, and a lot of butterflies are sort of bright colors. But that doesn't, you know, there's a lot of variability. And actually, there's a few moths that actually fly during the daytime. And so, just like a lot of things in nature, nothing is an absolute. There's always a few exceptions. But those are two good rules to go by. If you're flying it during the day or night, and what their antenna looks like. How do you tell the difference between a boy and a girl? With moths, it can be easy. Sometimes their patterns are different. On this one, it isn't. This is one of the tire moths. It's either a banded tussock moth or a sycamore tussock moth. Some of them are very different, like the aisle moth. The female looks very different from the male. But they know what the differences are, and that's important. The way scientists learn is that they look at them very carefully at some of their parts, and they're able to tell if they're a boy or a girl. That's one. Oh, cool. That's so cool. That is one of the... I'll have to look it up. I have no idea. Caterpillars are, you think moths are hard. Caterpillars are really hard. Some of them are easy, but most of them are really hard. See, but that one doesn't have any markings to speak of. It's just sort of brown and sort of blah looking. See, it's an inchworm. You see, caterpillars, moth and butterfly caterpillars. They have three pairs of little legs on the front that are jointed. Those are like real legs. And they have what are called toe legs. These are these little stumpy things. Butterflies and moths have four or fewer pairs. And this is an inchworm. And see, they only have two pairs of pearl legs. One, two. And so, and so he's the one that sort of, you know, they'll go, they'll move like that. So it's like an inchworm movement. Ooh. See, it's wrapping it up to the legs moving. And that's wrapping the silk around the moth. So these lights are attracting the moths and other predators are taking advantage of those lights because as moths are coming in, they can actually capture something to eat. All right, we dodged a few raindrops tonight, but we did find a lot of moths. Are there any other questions? Sue, so are moths in danger? Well, some moths are. And in fact, there's been a decline in insects in general over the last 20 or so years, and sometimes that's due to people using pesticides and other chemicals in an unwise way, and sometimes it's due to light pollution, the moths get confused with all the lights in the cities and such. And one other way is as you build towns and houses, the moths lose habitat like other wildlife. So it's a good idea to try and keep some natural areas around your house to help moths and other wildlife. All uh, right, Cooper, uh, uh, McKenna, Alden, thank you very much. Sue, thanks for going out with us and showing us all of these cool moths that we saw tonight. Uh, it was a great time. Uh, thank you all for joining us. We hope you enjoyed these, this moth video, this moth safari. We encourage you to get outdoors and, and see what types of moths you can find. Go out at night on your front porch, your back porch, cut the light on and see what you can uh, uh, pull in and see what you can see. Remember to cut it off before you go to bed so the moths can go back out and, and live their normal lives. We encourage you to get outdoors and explore the wild, wonderful wildlife of West Virginia. Bye. 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 Next up, we go over to our friend McKenna to read a book about moths. Hi, I'm McKenna Smith, 
and today I'm going to be reading to you Moth, an Evolution Story by Isabel Thomas and Daniel Ignis. This is a story of light and dark, of change and adaptation, of survival and hope. It starts with a little moth. A shiny cocoon wiggled and jiggled in the moonlight. Something was waking up from a long winter's sleep. Six little legs uncurled, two tiny antennae unfurled, and four salt and pepper wings stretched and quivered in the breeze. But hungry predators were nearby. Quickly, the moth flew away. The peppered moth joined the other peppered moths. Most had speckled, freckled wings. But sometimes a peppered moth was born with wings as dark as charcoal. The moths flittered and fluttered, skittered and swooped, and looped the loop all night long. Oh no, a bat! They looked for food and tried not to get eaten themselves. When the sun rose, the peppered moth dozed on lichen-colored covered branches. Silent still, they hid. Someone else was looking for food. Who was the best hidden? Who would survive? Silent still, the speckled moss seemed to disappear, but charcoal black wings were easy to spot on the pale branches. Dark colored moths made a feast for hungry chicks. The speckled freckled moths had the best camouflage. Their salt and pepper wings kept them safe from hungry eyes. They laid eggs of their own. The new moths had salt and pepper wings too. Every year, the same thing happened. Hundreds of tiny eggs hatched. The moths with the best camouflage survived long enough to have offspring and pass on their salt and pepper wings. This is why most, pe most pepper moths were speckled and freckled. But then, the world began to change. People built factories and burned coal to power magnificent machines. They made steam trains to take they made steam trains to take things here, there, and everywhere. Chimneys filled the air with smoke and soot. Pollution stained the clouds and blackened the branches where peppered moss slept. A bird went hunting for a snack. Now the world was darker. Which moths were disguised? Which moths would survive? Now the darkest moths had the best camouflage. Their charcoal covered wings kept them safe from hungry eyes. Now they lived long enough to lay eggs of their own. Their, and their wing color passed on to their offspring. And their offspring's offspring. 50 years later, there's just as many peppered moths as ever, but most were charcoal colored. The speckled freckled moths were rare. The moths adapted to the changes in the world. But that's not how the story ends. Next time you scramble through a forest or run around a backyard, be silent, be still. Look closely at the trees. You might spot a moth with wings as dark as charcoal or a moth with speckled, freckled wings because
people decided to clean up the air. They burned less coal and found new ways to power machines. Year by year by year, cities grew greener. The air all around became cleaner, and trees shed their sooty bark. Now the speckled, freckled moths are as camouflaged once again and live long enough to pass on their salt and pepper wings to their offspring. Today, both colors of moth find places to hide and survive. They're, and they're still telling their story of light and dark, of change and adaptation, of survival. and hope. The end. Thanks, McKenna. What a really cool book and such great illustrations. Next up, we're gonna go over to our friend, Miss Jenny and size up the moon. Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our sun, our moon, and the earth, and what size they are and how far apart they are from one another. So it's really hard to tell when we are here on earth just how big or small they are and how far or close they are to us. So we're going to use what's called a scale model to figure this out. I'm going to use Play-Doh and if you have Play-Doh at home you can get it out and predict along with me. So with my ball of Play-Doh, I'm going to split it into two parts. And right now we're going to look at the size of the Earth compared to the size of the Moon. And I want you to make a prediction. Make two balls out of your Play-Doh, one that you think may be the size of the Earth, and one that you think may be the size of the Moon. Do you think they're about the same size? Or is one bigger than the other? And how much bigger or smaller than the other is it? And once you've made your prediction, I also want you to think about how close or far away they are from one another. Have you done it yet? Okay, well while you're thinking about that, I'm going to get mine out and I'm going to tell you how close or how far away these are from one another. So at home, you can use another container of Play-Doh and you can figure out how to get 50 equal parts out of your Play-Doh. You could do that by rolling a long snake and then maybe measuring it and cutting it into parts. I used a kitchen scale at home and I measured my entire bowl of Play-Doh and then figured out how, what 1 50th of that Play-Doh would be. So I have this ball and this little ball. This is one part of 50. This would be our moon compared to the size of our earth. If our earth was hollow, we could fit 50 little moons inside of our earth on this scale. Our earth has about a two inch diameter on it. And this is our moon. Did you predict that? Are they about that size? And I also ask you to think about how far apart or close together they are. Did you put them really close together or did you put them far apart? So down here on the ground, I'm gonna show you just how far, far apart at this size our Earth and our Moon are at this scale. So down here, we're gonna put our Earth on one end and our Moon on the other. And there's 60 inches in between because at this ratio, we could put 30 Earths between the Earth and our Moon. But I also told you that we were going to talk today about the sun. So we saw how small the Earth is out of Play-Doh, about a two inch diameter, and we saw our tiny little moon, but how big is the sun that we see in our sky compared to those two things? So let's back it up a little bit. So here it is. If using the same scale, the sun up in our sky would be 18 feet in diameter compared to our two inch diameter Earth and our tiny little moon. That's pretty cool. It doesn't look that big up there in the sky, does it? And if we were to think about how far away our sun is at this scale to our Earth, it would be three and a half football fields away from here. That's a long ways away. So 
I hope you enjoyed learning about the sun and the moon and the earth and how their size and their distance are related to one another. It's time for my favorite time of day, snack time. Let's head over to Heather Cook and learn how to make some unique apple cookies. Health Educator in Lincoln and Boone County for WVU Extension's Gamer Nutrition Program. Today I wanted to show you how to make one of our healthy snacks that we use with our programs. It's called Apple Cookies. So this is a healthy alternative to actual cookies. Um, this just gives you an opportunity to get more fruits and more protein into your diet. So um, before we get started, um, anytime you are going to cook or prepare something or eat, there's two things you should do. One, wash your hands. Um, I've already done that with my sink back here. And um, any fruits or vegetables that you're going to use that are fresh, you should make sure to wash them um, for about 10 seconds underneath the water and just rub your hands over them or you have a little brush, scrub them. Um, that just helps to get any dirt or anything uh, that may be on them off before you prepare them. So um, you'll need three ingredients for this recipe. You'll need apples, of course. Um, you'll need peanut butter. Um, to spread on your apple and you will need some sort of dried fruit. So um, I've already got some slices made over here. Um, you are going to take a knife and a cutting board, slice the end of your apple off. You're going to slice in circular motion, motion so that it'll be the shape of a cookie, which is why it's called apple cookies. Um, once you start slicing your slices, um, you're going to notice that the core of the apple is in the slice. You'll want to use your knife to very carefully cut out um, your core kind of like a square shape, make a little square around your core. Um, if you have a cookie cutter, that's okay to use too, as it's probably a little bit safer. Um, and you just cut that little square around it and then you can easily just push it out like that. So um, I've got my apple slice made for my cookie. It's got peanut butter. Just smear the peanut butter on. Um, some other options that you can use um, instead of, um, I'm going to be using dried cranberries today. Other options that you could use would be raisins, um, shredded coconut, or any other kind of um, dried fruit that you may want to use or have at your house. So, um, like I said, I'm going to use some dried cranberries because that's what we have here on hand in our house. And, um, you can see that this is your apple cookie. Healthy alternative. Um, your apple should make about eight to 10 cookies, depending on how thick you slice it. You can slice them thinner uh, or you can slice them thicker. So, um, hope you enjoy your apple cookie recipe. Hey, Energy Express friends. Did you have a fun day? I know I did. Well, We'll see you again soon for more fun and more activities. Have a good one. Bye-bye.